I learned from three great mentors. Okay. One of them was Bob Trivers, who's still alive. Uh, I still know Bob. I learned a ton. I was an undergraduate. He was my advisor of his. Uh, uh, and I learned from Dick Alexander, who was not as famous a person, but was as clear headed a thinker as anybody in his generation of evolutionary biologists. He was like a, a Dawkins like figure. Um, but he was, uh, his sentences were so complex that I think he just did not reach the audience that Dawkins did. But anyways, brilliant guy. Um, and I learned from Dawkins who I never met until 2018, but I learned because he wrote so much and uh, I was able to read his books and they really resonated with me. And so I learned that he was the mentor I'd never met mm. until 2018. Okay. When I did meet him on stage and, uh, we had an extensive interaction, which was only partially captured on video, unfortunately. Okay. There's some of it is available, but some of it was lost apparently to everyone. But what I found was that he had become confused about his own ideas. And this is not, he is an older guy, but he's mentally very sharp. This was not a question of him having, you know, lost his capacity to think. This was a question of him having lost the courage of his convictions. So what I said to him on stage actually was that I found him in conflict with himself, that his current ideas were um, defeated by his previous ideas. And I wanted him to just look at what happens when uh, you juxtapose them. And this is, sorry, this is a specifically about a biological concept? Yes. Okay. A, a biological concept of his own invention. Okay. That's the thing. So Richard Dawkins is the inventor of the concept of memes, right? And memes, you so cultural evolution was, it was understood to exist, but you really needed the concept of memes to turn it into a rigorous object to study. Um, and what I found when I talked to him about the meaning of cultural evolution, the meaning of mimetic uh, adaptation, was that he viewed it as trivial and basically analogous to genetic evolution. But he did not understand that it was actually the potent force that made our species capable of the unique evolutionary tricks that it can do that no other creature can do right he sees you know the he sees happy birthday the song right as a good example of how memes can evolve but it's an utterly trivial example he doesn't understand that catholicism is a much better example right that catholicism and the way it evolves into protestantism and that basically the story of human evolution is the story of how the genes offloaded the heavy lifting of adaptation to the software layer and that that software layer and the genetic <laughs> hardware layer have a direct relationship. It's not that cultural evolution is like genetic evolution. Cultural evolution is a means to an end employed by genes to solve problems the genes themselves cannot solve. Dawkins, the inventor of the concept that allows you to see that, couldn't see it. Which and, I, and I'm stunned you, by. Yeah. Well, what is your explanation for that? Well, I think there are a couple of things that are true. I think one thing is that nothing about evolutionary biology is remotely politically incorrect. I mean, is politically correct. It is a politically incorrect discipline that is, I mean, it's not that it's, it's not that what it says is bad. It's that what it says about humans I is see. arbitrary. I right? see, I see. And so the problem mm -hmm. is a, you know, in 1976, when Dawkins wrote The Selfish Gene, he was a young man. He was a young gun and he wasn't an established scientist. He didn't have a long publication record. He was a very gifted writer and he was a very gifted thinker. And he had that sort of brash young man thing. And he wrote a brilliant book and it caught on and it made him who he is, right? But the point is, as an established person with something to lose, as an older person who isn't, you know, brash and ready to go all in on these concepts, uh, I think he has... I mean, some of the things he said to me on stage were 
thoughts that would be more characteristic of Stephen Jay Gould, who is like the antithesis of Richard Dawkins analytically, right? They believed inverse things. And yet what I found Dawkins saying on stage were things that Stephen Jay Gould might have said and were shocking coming out of Dawkins' mouth. And I believe that part of that is about uh, having been right and uh, losing the courage of those convictions because of the danger of where it might lead. Okay, let me let me rip off this for a little bit. This is fascinating, um, fascinating. So it might be that part of what's going on here is a high level of, let's say, conceptual ability in specific domains or, or even specific aspects of specific domains might not port onto thinking generally. So let me, let me be a, a bit more specific. It could be the case that when you read the work of Richard Dawkins, you are seeing a, an actually impressive uh, idea structure. And then we make this inference that the impressive idea structure comes from a mind that must be generally competent in creating these idea structures. But this is not just a, a one hit wonder type thing, that there has to be a level of skill that we would expect would translate into especially different claims within that one domain. Like you would, you would say Richard Dawkins is a competent biologist. You would like to say that because he wrote this incredible book. When I look over history, I'm not sure that's true. And I'm not sure it's the case that being really, really good on that one thing translates generally, which is shocking. Okay. This is, this is beautiful because okay. I actually have in, in this, I mean, I hate to do it, Richard, if you're watching, I apologize for analyzing you this way, <laughs> uh, but here's the problem with what you just said. Okay. The disagreement between Dawkins and me centered around the question of what to do with religion and things that behave like it. Mm. And Dawkins' point, Dawkins is, of course, a famous atheist, and his point is this is a mind virus. Uh -huh. My point when, you know, we, we somehow, I've forgotten exactly how, but we asked each other on stage sort of, well, what do you think? And he said, mind virus or the equivalent. And I said, no, it's extended phenotype. Now, extended phenotype is a Richard Dawkins concept, which he himself considers his most important contribution to biology. Okay, that's his own assessment. So in addressing your hypothesis about what might be going on, my point is actually the zone in which Dawkins has to be hyper-competent yeah. in order for him to see what it is that I think should be right in front of okay. him is his area of specialty more than okay. anyone else's on earth. I love that point. I was not expecting that correction to go in that direction, but I love that point. Okay, so let me throw out a new uh, a new theory here. Again, I don't I don't have the answer to these questions. I'm just trying to come up with a uh, some plausible theory for the information I'm taking in. Okay, okay. Here here would be a, a more controversial claim. Is it the case then that there's a genuine possibility that uh, excellent writers are maybe synthesizing concepts that they don't themselves understand. So could it be the case that like, when you look at the history, for example, of the theory of relativity, did it originate with Einstein? No parts of it. I mean, a synthesis of it was with Einstein, but there were little parts uh, uh, here and there beforehand. Now I'm not I actually, I think Einstein is one of the few historical thinkers, a few recent historical thinkers who I'd say seem to have a lot of, uh, general purpose conceptual skill. He was he was sort of aware of the process of theorizing, I think, in a respectable way that a lot of his contemporaries weren't. But but maybe it's the case that uh, sorry, I've ne I've never met Richard, so it's I guess it's okay if I uh, you know uh, speak off the cuff here. But maybe it's the case that that could be an example of somebody sit putting ideas together in a way that they genuinely themselves don't understand. Maybe that's what's going on. I don't think so. And I'm, I, I think now I'm, I'm putting together all of the things that, that um, happened surrounding this conversation. And I'm realizing okay. that I might have the answer as okay. to what happened. 
Um, and it was almost the way it unfolded was very shocking before I went on stage with Dawkins. I was in Chicago, and while I was in Chicago, I met with Jerry Coyne, who I had also never met. Right? He's another another mm -hmm. great from my field. And I put a question to him. Um, so over breakfast, I asked I asked Jerry Coyne. I said, I don't understand why it is that there has been no major theoretical progress in our discipline since 1976. And this doesn't seem to bother anyone, right? That suggests we're doing something wrong. And he said something that astonished me. I couldn't believe I was hearing one of the greats say this. And what he said was, well, you know, I think my generation, that is Coin's generation, got it all pretty well right. And there wasn't a lot left. Okay. So, so I'm sorry, continue. Well, that's only half the story. So first of all, I used to believe that myself. Okay. When I started studying with Bob Trivers, I did feel like I'd been born too late because I thought I was good at evolutionary thinking, but all the big stuff had been done. And it took me a while to realize how many big questions were completely unanswered. And you just didn't hear them very often because the lack of progress had caused people to learn to stop talking about it. Right. And it was like question That's after a question, it. big fundamental stuff was unanswered. And as soon as I figured that out, I knew what I wanted to do with my life, but I didn't see it immediately. So coin was sort of, uh, revisiting this idea that they had gotten all the big stuff, right. And the only things left were cleanup. Now here's the part that blew my mind on stage with Dawkins. I asked him the question, why do you think we haven't made any major theoretical. I mean, you know, you can ask an evolutionary biologist, what are the great theoretical insights that we've had since 76? And I, there's no good answer to that question, right? They don't exist. So I asked him that. He said the same damn thing. He said the same damn thing. This is somebody who certainly has to understand that we do not yet have a robust explanation for, you know, we know why a peacock has a fancy tail because the peahens don't mate with them if they don't. We don't know why the peahens care, right? We've got lots of ideas and we can all name the ideas, but nothing totally works. And I can tell you why they don't work, but never mind that. The point is here I am sitting with Richard Dawkins for the second time in one day, being told <laughs> by one of the greats in my field that his generation answered all the big questions and the lack of progress was because we were done. And it's just like, well, Okay. Even, you know, yeah, yeah. All right. Go ahead. So, so, so you take a, a young independent mind like myself who has not met the greats as you've described them. I listen to that and I go, why would you call these people greats? How could you arrive at the conclusion that somebody who believes we have arrived at the final truth on an extraordinarily complex topic is, is a great mind. That seems like a very, very elementary error. You know, and, well, here, here's the thing. I mean, I know that there's- I'm going to get you in trouble, Brett. I'm sorry. You don't have to answer Look, uh, if you don't want to. If, I, okay. if, there, if there was more trouble I could yeah, get into, fair, I fair. might be worried, but I've already gotten in trouble with everybody. Here's the thing. Dick Alexander, my PhD advisor, would never in a million years have said that, right? He, he wouldn't have okay. formulated the thought and he would have mocked anybody who did. Right. Now, okay. So I do think there's a, there's at least two types of what I'm calling the greats. And I guess the point is really they need two different categories. Right. Okay. There are people who have accomplished lasting things who may or may not be really good at it. Right. Darwin was a great, but apparently the idea was also ready to pop. Right. The fact that Wallace and Darwin both had the idea tells us that that one wasn't going to wait very long. Right. And it happens that Darwin was also great at what he did. This right? also happens. I would love to talk about this in the history of mathematics, but maybe later. Same thing happens. Cool. Well, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this, this taxonomy because I think it has a lot to say. But it is totally also possible for somebody to be at the right place at the right time and not really have extraordinary capacity. Um, huh. I don't think that could possibly be true of Dawkins. He's and and really, Dawkins is so good at synthesis um, that which I think is some is a process we undervalue, right? We don't even really talk about it as the counterpoint to reductionism, right? And we should because the point is, yes, reductionism 
buys you something, but you don't leverage that something until you synthesize it and figure out what the real picture is, right? Um, so anyway, may, maybe I'm making excuses for the man, or maybe my my inkling is right that something changed about his level of intellectual courage. Well, let me ask you one more question on this. So you said you had an example of somebody who you considered a great, who would never make the claim that we solved biology. Okay. So do you think what, that, what was that gentleman's name? Dick Alexander. Dick Alexander. Okay. Do you think that Dick Alexander would consider Richard Dawkins a great knowing uh, the claim that, that you, that uh, you just said, you know, if, if, he, if he were aware of Dawkins claim that biology is solved, what do you I, think he would say? I think I know exactly what he would say because I think I had the conversation with him. Okay. Um, so that's the thing is, you know, it's not a huge field. And, and the fact that all of these greats of various kinds coexisted and we knew them meant that you sort of heard these conversations. And the thing is, Dick respected Dawkins and Dawkins respected Dick, but I don't think... Dick certainly did not see Dawkins as um, transcendent in some way. Right. He did see him as competent, very competent, let's say. Um, you know, and I think I think that's probably what what uh, what Dawkins would say of of Alexander also. Um, but you know, the problem is, you know, again, back to the ape thing. You know, biologists are also largely apes, and um, largely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I I'd leave like open to hear the, the possibility. <laughs> there are some others, but all right, all the ones I knew certainly uh, show that that evidence. But um, the there is resentment of a guy like Dawkins because of you know you've got all of these bright people in a brand new landscape of ideas, figuring out how a whole different type of biology works and making tons of progress, and you have somebody like Dawkins who's very good at understanding it and very good at explaining it. And so he disproportionately shows up on people's, on the mm. public's radar yeah, yeah. Um, because of his position, yes. which I think did Dawkins a disservice because his real gift was synthesis, which I believe is actual science. It's not popularization. Synthesis is as important as reductionism, right? And the fact that Dawkins was also good at popularizing uh got him dismissed too easily. But anyway, Dick respected him, but I don't think he, uh, I don't think he thought Dawkins was special except in his ability to communicate, which everybody agrees is uh, extremely good. So I think that is a consistent pattern that we would see across disciplines where the people that the general public uh, and maybe uh, undergrad student, undergrad students would consider as greats aren't. Uh, I, I think generally when you look closely at different disciplines, it looks like there are a few brilliant original minds that are coming up with original concepts, doing, doing interesting work. And then there is another type of mind, which is the, uh, the articulator, somebody that can skillfully talk about the concepts, uh, you know, do, do a interview for, um, PBS, that becomes uh, uh, that 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 gets a the cultural designation of this here as an intellectual, and then and then problems are caused from that moment because what what happens is like there is a complex social phenomenon that happens where people will start to take sides, and now it's now there are going to be this is uh, it seems to be within academia as well there are going to be defenders of the personality. And uh, and uh, critics of the personality, and then very shortly, it is difficult to carefully reason through ideas because people start playing a social game. 